So hi everyone, uh, welcome again to the Shannon channel. I'm really happy today to have Mathieu Bloch from uh, Georgia Tech. And today he's gonna talk to us about covert communications. And uh, Mathieu, we're all gonna be listening to your talk. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Salim. Uh, it's a superb initiative. I'm also very happy and honored that you asked me to do it. Um, and so yeah, the talk today is about some uh, topic that we've started looking at with my student over the last year. And um, I'm really excited to share some of the results. So I think I'm sharing my slides now, is that correct? Yes, yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, this is uh, really meant to be more like a, I'll go into some details, but really more to give a motivation for what we're doing and highlight some of our key results. It's joint work with two of my PhD students, uh, Isaac Kadampot, who uh, was instrumental in doing some of the coding theory work and Merda Tamasby, was really a key uh, driver behind the information theoretic analysis. So uh, let me uh, dive right in the topic right now. Um, let me select the right window. All right. So, I mean, as you might have heard, quantum communication has been quite big in the news lately, uh, in part uh, because of the resurgence of interest in quantum computing. My talk here is not about computing, it's about communications, but we're definitely benefiting from uh, the interest in quantum again. So it's like machine learning, it comes back every 10 years and then it goes away. Um, but so if you look at recent research articles, um, there's been a lot of you know, publications in nature, in, uh, in science, and all, all these papers, what they're really highlighting is that we've made a lot of progress to actually um, exchange information encoded onto quantum states over a lot of distances. And I think a lot of that was driven in part by the work that China did when they launched a a satellite that is able to share entangled photons that you can actually measure on Earth. And that was an absolutely superb feat of engineering. And people have been able to essentially do experiments that we were able to do on Earth, but over much longer distances. And all these papers I'm showing are kind of celebrating that, that success. Um, so what, what you can envision is, you know, a quantum internet. Now, when people talk about quantum communication, it's a little bit misleading because we have systems that already work. Why would you go quantum? And from the perspective of communications, I think it's not uh, overreaching to say that the main interest of, in quantum communication comes from one very specific niche, which is quantum key distribution. And so in, in a nutshell, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time refreshing everyone's memory as to what that is. But in a nutshell, quantum key distribution is not unlike information theory in that there is one foundational paper that you can really identify. In that case, that's a paper from uh, Charles Bennett, uh, who's getting the Shannon Award and Gilles Brassard in 1984, which they called quantum cryptography, public key distribution, and coin tossing in 1984. Um, and a few years after, uh, 92, there was a first experimental demonstration uh, of what it is. So what is quantum key distribution? Really, it's the idea that by using the laws of quantum mechanics, you can actually ensure that you can exchange information that is provably uh, secret against an adversary, and in a way it's unconditional in the sense that the only assumption that you're making is that you're limited by the laws of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. Now, uh, the, the main reason why you can actually do something like that in the quantum world that you cannot do in the classical world can be seen, you know, with my little doodling here. So what you have to imagine is that you have a legitimate transfer, Alice, that's preparing information, classical bits she puts on a quantum state, and she's going to transmit them over a channel to a legitimate receiver, Bob, that is able to measure quantum states. Right now, if there's an adversary, the adversary is in between, it's eavesdropping. And what's really unique about quantum is that if you encode your bits on a quantum state, measuring quantum states is much more difficult than measuring classical states, in part because you can encode things in a way such that the output of your measurement is not deterministic. You know, that's called using non-orthogonal quantum states. And what that means is that if you do things in the right way, when your adversary eavesdrops, it has to make a decision as to how to measure things. And as a result, every once in a while, it will measure something, um, not get the result that it should get. And if it wants to avoid detection, it has to forward something to Bob, at which point it might actually introduce errors that should not have been there in the first place. So this is really uh, quantum cryptography uh, 101 without any rigorous proof or explanation. But that's the fundamental idea. It's the idea is that because of the specific nature of quantum, quantum states, legitimate parties can estimate the information that has been leaked to a potential adversary. 
Another way you might want to think about it is in terms of what's called the no cloning theorem. If you have a photon, the difference between a photon and a classical wave is that you cannot split a photon in half. You know, I cannot take half a photon for myself and forward the other half to you. You can't do that. So uh, that's one way to think about what limits the uh, amount of information that an adversary can, can uh, obtain. Another way to think about it is in terms of uh, Heisenberg uncertainty relations, where you know that there is a fundamental trade-off with how accurately you can measure position and momentum if you have a quantum particle. So th these are all the intuitive concepts behind the limitation of the information that can be leaked to an adversary. Of course, making that more precise requires uh, more rigorous formalism and some serious quantum information theory, but uh, that's the spirit that I want you to keep in the back of your mind. All right, so to be a little bit more specific because we're gonna use that a little bit later, what is a quantum key distribution protocol? So the good news is most of a quantum key distribution protocol is not quantum. All right, a lot of it is classical. And so let me go over, over the basics in that slide. So the only real quantum phase of a quantum key distribution protocol is phase one, what I call the transmission of non-orthogonal quantum states over the channel. Okay, so therein the idea is that Alice trying to communicate to Bob will encode bits onto uh, non-orthogonal quantum states. And the need for non-orthogonality comes again from the necessity of preventing the eavesdropper from making a perfect measurement. And then once you do that through some appropriate public communication to disclose some of the measurements that Bob is doing, it's possible to infer the information that was leaked to the eavesdropper. So I'm not gonna go um, on to the details of how that works. I mean, that's what most of the literature on quantum key distribution is about. How do you design a protocol for which you can provably, provably bound the information leaked to an adversary? But for the purpose of that talk, what I will ask you to accept is that if I do that phase one properly, then at the end of phase one, I can assume that I have a joint distribution between the measurements X of Alice, Y of Bob, and Z of the eavesdropper that I know. I know that joint distribution. So for those of you who are familiar with the wiretap channel model, the big difference between the quantum version here and the non-quantum version is that in the non-quantum version, you have to assume that you're given that P, X, Y, Z, whereas if you use these quantum protocols, you can assume that you have a way to actually estimate it. Right? That's, that's kind of a, a very... Uh, high level explanation as to what's going on here. All right, so uh, pictorially again, using my little doodling here, Alice will prepare bits that she encodes onto quantum states. Bob will eventually make measurements. And because potentially the adversary has been interfering with the system, uh, it will create errors. So the one assumption I'm making here is that you have somehow more errors uh, on the adversary's measurement than on Bob's measurement. Again, uh, this is something that you can measure indirectly at Alice and Bob without ever really talking to the adversary to infer that you're indeed in a situation where that's possible. So I've indicated these you know, errors in orange. I hope you can see that on my slide. So this is really the only quantum part of the quantum key distribution protocol. Uh, it's no small feat to actually prove that things will work this way, but everything else we're gonna do from now on is purely classical. Okay, so phase two of a quantum key distribution protocol is actually to make sure that Alice and Bob can agree on the measurements they've made. Because they know that because of channel imperfections, because of the action of the adversary, they have some errors. And so what they will do is they will exchange publicly some information to correct these errors. Okay, I'll, you can think about it as doing some version of Slate and Wolf. I'll discuss that in a second uh, to, to send just the bare minimum of information that allows them to correct it. So Alice will create um, a message, I call it W here, that's a function of her bits, Xn, her sequence of bits. She's gonna send that over a public channel to Bob and Bob based on that will hopefully be able to correct its errors. Right? So my uh, orange bits have been flipped back to green. That's a correct value. We're assuming you're doing that correctly. But of course, because everything is happening publicly, what it means is that from the perspective of the adversary, you're also helping the adversary a little bit. All right, so uh, assuming that the adversary had more errors and you did not disclose more information than what you had to, the adversary might be able to correct a few bits, but it still has some lingering errors that it cannot uh, decide on. And the last phase of a quantum key distribution protocol that's called privacy amplification is actually to process the observation that Alice and Bob have, which hopefully now are the same, to extract the secret key. And the way it's done is actually in a fairly almost deterministic way by applying a well-chosen function Effectively, you're doing hashing with universal hash functions to shrink 
their sequence of bits to something much smaller in such a way that intuitively it creates a catastrophic error propagation from the perspective of the adversary so that uh, Alice and Bob having started from the same sequence get the exact same measurement, but the adversary having some uncertainty on a few bits is now totally confused as to what the output is. Okay, so I'll formalize phase two and phase three in a second, but this is in a nutshell what a quantum key distribution protocol is. And phase two and phase three are actually pure classical information theory and coding theory only phase one is the quantum part of it. Uh, Mathieu, do you assume that the eavesdropper in, the th in phase three, does he know the function phi? Uh, absolutely, the function, very good question. The function phi is known. Okay. So you're not hiding anything. So the, the way you want to think about it is, think about multiplying the sequence uh, xn by a fat matrix of dimension k times n that will shrink it from the perspective of the adversary that creates a catastrophic AR propagation. All right, so I'll, I'll mention just in a second exactly how that can work, but that's exactly the right intuition, phi is no. Sounds good? All right, so let me be a little bit more specific as to you know, what are phase two and phase three. I'm not gonna talk about phase one too much. So phase two is actually something information theorists are very familiar with. Uh, the physicists call that information reconciliation, uh, but you'll see in a second that that's just a synonym for something we know much uh, more under the name of source coding with side information. So at a high level, you can imagine Alice has a sequence X, Bob has a sequence Y, which is not exactly the same. The two are correlated. Um, in information theory, we like to think about, you know, there's a discrete memoryless channels relating the two. And the goal is for Alice having X to actually encode it and compress it in a message W in such a way that Bob can recover it knowing W and Y. And that's exactly what information reconciliation is. Um, we like to think about measuring the performance in terms of the probability of error, probability that your estimate of x, which I call x hat, is not equal to x. And we like to measure also performance in terms of the rate that I need. What is the minimum rate of the message w? It takes n values that I need to make that happen. And asymptotically, there's a celebrated result by Slepin and Bolt from 73 that says that, you know, if indeed you have a memoryless channel between x and y, and x is id according to px, you need a rate that is at least h of x given y. Okay, and that's essentially the best you can do. So information reconciliation is nothing but source coding with side information. All right, so keep that in the back of your mind. You know, that's what's gonna limit the performance of what I call phase two. Now phase three is something, uh, oh, and I forgot to mention, that the good news is we know how to do that. All right, so we can implement that using syndrome coding and uh, it's, people know how to do that using LDPC codes, turbo codes and polar codes, whichever favorite family of codes you like. Now phase three, uh, which is the one where you effectively process the sequence to extract uh, secrecy, uh, that's what the physicists call privacy amplification. Uh, I like to call that channel randomness extraction uh, for the reason that we'll expose in a second. So the idea there is that you're looking at the problem from the perspective of the adversary, right? So the adversary has a sequence Z and that sequence Z is correlated to the sequence X that Alice is observing. That's what I'm showing here in this uh, diagram. And uh, the goal now is for Alice to somehow process X in such a way that she can extract uh, what I call S, which she could view as a secret key. So how do you formalize that? So one way to formalize that is to say that you want to process X to obtain a sequence S of random bits, uniformly distributed random bits, in such a way that these bits are not only uniform, but they're also somewhat independent from Z, which is what the attacker has access to. And one way to measure that is to use the relative entropy or divergence D between the joint distribution between S and Z, fixed by the channel and the processing that you're doing, and a product of marginals where uh, S, my key is uniformly distributed, that's what I call Q, and PZ is whatever PZ was supposed to do, and here I'm choosing an ID PZ, all right? So if that is small, if that D is small, you can guarantee that indeed your bits are essentially uniformly distributed and independent from the observation of your adversary Z. And here the goal, unlike before, is to maximize the rate at which you can do that. So you want to maximize the rate of the key that you extract, log K over N, in such a way that you can drive the divergence to zero as in the limit of large, uh, large length. Now, the reason I call that channel randomness extraction is because intuitively, if you go back to my diagram, what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, I want to extract from X the randomness that stems from the channel that links X and Z and not from the input to the channel Z. 
right? So in a way, you're extracting the randomness that is in the channel with kernel wx given z, but not the randomness coming from pz. Now, of course, that extraction is in a statistical sense. You, you don't extract physical bits, really. It's statistical. But I like this idea of channel randomness extraction. And it's also motivated by um, you know, what the maximum r is, the maximum rate. So that you can trace that result to many papers. I think it's fair to say it shows up in the work of Alshvid and Shizar in 93 on secret sharing. Um, the name privacy amplification, to the best of my knowledge, only showed up in a paper by Bennett and collaborators in 95. And a lot of people uh, have revisited that, you know, measuring the extraction of secrecy in different ways um, and with different proofs over the years. But the nice result is, is something that says you can do more. The rate, the maximum rate uh, that you can achieve is no more than H, the entropy of X given Z in the case of memoryless sources and channels. And that's really intuitive because H of X given Z is the uncertainty on the output X given the input Z. And that really captures how much more noise is your channel introducing. And if you have an additive channel, it's not hard to convince you that H of X given Z is really the entropy of the additive noise that you and so that's what privacy amplification is. And as Salim was mentioning, um, that extraction here is done under the assumption that the decoder, what I call the decoder here, what I call the function phi just before, is known to everyone. So there, you're not hiding anything from the adversary. The good news is, again, that's something we know how to do. Uh, it's possible to implement that using families of universal hash functions. And that's something that was established uh, in the 90s. All right, so th that's quantum key distribution in a nutshell. So um, last thing I want to mention is that I'm not really hiding much in these two slides in the sense that if you know how to do source coding with side information using uh, you know, your favorite class of codes, if you know how to do privacy amplification using universal hash functions, you can just glue the two together in the sense that you can compute by how much you need to shrink the sequence to obtain a key uh, just accounting for the fact that you disclose information over the public channel fairly easily. There's a very nice paper by uh, Cashin and Moore from 97 that tells you how to do that. So this is fairly well established and people have actually built systems uh, based on that. So what's the state of the art today in quantum key distribution? There's been a lot of progress. So as I mentioned before, you know, the er early paper was 1984. The first experimental demonstration was 92. And when I talk about an experimental demonstration, I'm talking about a transmission over 12 centimeters. So that, that was a link, but a very short one. But since then, people have made uh, tremendous progress, both theoretically and experimentally. So on the theoretical side, over the last two decades, people can now guarantee unconditional security of uh, quantum key distribution against the most general type of attacks. These are attacks where your adversary performs what are called coherent attacks in which it can actually intercept all the states that you're sending, put them in a quantum memory and perform joint measurements after uh, as long as it wants. So it can store states indefinitely and wait for you to do all the public communication. So it's, no, no one knows how to do that in practice right now, but potentially that's doable. So the adversary is only limited by the laws of quantum mechanics. People also don't use asymptotic results like the one I illustrated before, you know, these asymptotic cute limits that we have in information theory. They can account for the statistical effect of performing things at finite length. And also they can even ensure that you can actually generate secret keys even when an adversary might be able to partially control your devices. Meaning the adversary has the ability to even influence what Bob is measuring, for instance. So even under such conditions, one can now prove that quantum key distribution is possible. On the experimental side, I mean, people have been breaking records in recent years in terms of transmission distance and data rates, much beyond the 12 centimeters of uh, 1992. And again, uh, I'm just putting here a few numbers that I thought were interesting, but most of them are obtained recently with that uh, Missy satellite launched by China early 2017. Whereas, you know, a satellite is in free space. So, I mean, it's, I think it's low Earth orbit, but you can easily obtain transmissions over thousands of kilometers. To the best of my knowledge, the latest experiment they did was a transmission of a secret key between Austria and China. So, pretty impressive. And the, the data rates, uh, one thing I want you to keep in the back of your mind, when you're talking about the data rates of quantum key distribution, they are not high. We're not talking about terabytes 
for terabits per second, we're talking about megabits per second most of the time, if not much, much less. Um, but the goal is to get some secret key, uh, not necessarily a super highway. So, you know, with all that being said, you know, what it shows is that quantum key distribution is, you know, there are still, of course, some engineering and theoretical challenges, but it works in practice, it's very stable, and it's fairly mature. And what we were interested in looking at with my students is, what else can we do? I mean, is there something else that we could try to provide beyond this unconditional secrecy here? And what we really tried to do, and what I want to talk about today, is how to make uh, quantum key distribution not only secret, but also covered. And what I mean by covered, I'll specify more formally in a few slides, but it's the idea that you want to make the fact that you're doing or running a quantum key distribution protocol undetectable by an adversary. So that if someone detects what you're doing, they can't even prove in any statistically meaningful way that you're actually uh, running and exchanging a secret key. All right, so we haven't completely cracked the problem, um, but I think we've made some interesting preliminary progress and that's what I want to talk about today. So the model that we've been looking at is the one I'm showing you on that slide here. And it's a very baby version of what covert and secret key generation could be over a quantum channel. We're nowhere close to proving that we are secure against the most general class of attacks, but it still has its own challenges. And that was not so trivial to establish. So the model we have is the following. So we're assuming that we have two legitimate parties, Alice and Bob, they're trying to exchange a secret key. And for that, they have access to two resources. They have access to a quantum channel, which is what I'm representing by that uh, yellow box here. And it's a classical quantum channel, meaning that Alice can create a sequence of bits, essentially. You can think of them as bits. Each bit gets encoded into a quantum state, which is represented by a density matrix. Uh, which I call row x b e if x is my input, and then Bob and Eve receive you know, these two density matrices, row b and row e. It's a broadcast channel. Um, I'm assuming here for simplicity that that channel is known. Okay, so that's a really big assumption. What it means is that I'm circumventing all the difficulties that people had to solve to establish why phase one in this quantum key distribution protocol is actually working. So I'm kind of sidestepping that for now. Um, what I'm assuming is that the adversary can perform some attacks, meaning it can do some measurements on uh, what it receives, um, considering what are called collective attacks, in the sense that the adversary is able to apply, you know, a very generic quantum measurement, but that quantum measurement is the same on all its observations. So there's a restriction there. In a way, you can think of it as like an ID measurement, um, and you don't get to control that. Um, so that's the first resource, that quantum channel here. The second resource is an authenticated public channel. So that one allows Alice and Bob to exchange information publicly, uh, and Eve doesn't get to interfere with that. Now, what we want to do is we want the communication to be undetectable. So we have to define what it means to be undetectable. And for that, what we're going to say is we're going to say that, you know, if Alice has the ability to transmit bits, so zero or one, the bit zero is encoded into a density matrix, rho zero BE, which means you're not doing anything. That's what you would expect to observe at Alice, at Bob and Eve, if nothing happens on the channel. So, you know, if you think about it, it's like I'm not sending any light into my optical fiber. That's what it means. Now, because the channel is itself potentially noisy, what Eve and Bob receive is, is a density matrix that's not necessarily trivial, right? So there could be noise added to the channel. Even if I don't send energy in the input, I might get something at the output. So that's what row zero B is, is capturing, but that's that default innocent behavior. And that behavior is known to everyone. The channel is known to everyone. Now, the, the way a protocol would operate is then as follows. So Alice and Bob would you know, use local randomness and potentially some common randomness are here. Um, let's not worry about it too much. And they're going to operate in T stages. In every stage T, Alice is going to transmit a bit over the channel by encoding it onto a quantum state. She's going to send that over the channel. Bob is going to make a measurement. He's going to send back something over the public channel. That's going to then help Alice to decide what is the next bit that she sends. All right, so it's an iterative process. And after a capital T stages like this, Alice and Bob will then compute binary strings, which I call SX and SY whose lengths would be Lx and Ly. And they're going to agree somehow that 
what they want to use as secret key will be the first LX and LY bits of SX and SY, all right? So um, there's just something a bit subtle here. You could say, why am I distinguishing between the binary strings S and the actual key K? It's for simplicity of formalizing the problem. I'll, see that. I'll show you that in a second. Um, if you want to ignore that subtlety, that's totally fine. Okay, so that's the generic protocol. Now, we want the protocol to be useful, so we have to define exactly what it means for the key that Alice and Bob are extracting to be secure and what it means for it to be covered. So uh, we're gonna put constraints or performance metrics on, on what the protocol is. So of course, the protocol has to be reliable in the sense that Alice and Bob should agree on the same thing, right? So we want the probability of error being the probability that the key that Alice gets is not equal to the key that Alice Bob gets to be small, less than some epsilon. And that implicitly assumes that you know, the lengths of the keys, of course, have to be the same. Secrecy is going to be measured in terms of a relative entropy between two uh, things, um, quantum relative entropy. So the first term here is a joint uh, density matrix between Eve's observation E, the public messages W sent over the public channel, and the key SX that you generate. And on the right-hand side of that relative entropy, you have sort of a, a tensor product here between a density matrix, a joint density matrix between observations E and W, but independently of that, there is a density matrix that just captures the fact that the key S, X, is going to be uniformly distributed and independent of E and W, all right? So if that relative entropy is small, it means that effectively the key that is computed is independent of the observation of the adversary and the public communication, so it is secret. Now, th these things are not new. This is what you would do in quantum key distribution. What we're adding on top of that is the notion of coveredness. And the notion of coveredness is measured, again, in terms of a relative entropy. But here, what we're asking for is we're asking for the joint density matrix between the eavesdropper's observation E and the public communication W to essentially be indistinguishable from a density matrix on the eavesdropper's observation that looks like you've not done anything. So it looks like the density matrix rho zero E, which is what the eavesdropper would expect if you were never actually transmitting anything but a sequence of zeros on the channel. So that's what you expect if you don't communicate. And this is independent of something that happens on the public channel, which we choose to be uniform bits. So said differently, our notion of coveredness says that on the quantum channel, it looks like you're receiving the output of the channel when nothing is transmitted. On the public channel, it looks like you're observing completely random bits that are independent of what's happening on the quantum channel. That's our definition of coveredness. And our goal is to try to understand when is it actually possible to design an efficient protocol that allows key expansion, meaning that if you had some you know, little bit of common randomness secret to Alice and Bob to start the protocol, in the end, the number of key bits that you generate exceed the number of common randomness bits that you started with, so that you're essentially expanding secrecy. You bootstrap the system to start with, but it expands over time. So that, that's our objective. And so, I have a question. So yes. uh, I'm a little bit confused about the model for uh, the, uh, the public channel. So the eavesdropper sees the public channel? Absolutely. So the eavesdropper sees the public channel. Okay. So what we're hiding is we're hiding the fact that there's something happening on the quantum channel. Okay. So the coveredness constraint, and, and that's something that you could criticize in our model. Uh, you know, a true covered model would not have a public channel. Everything would happen at the quantum level. Uh, but for simplicity here, we're still keeping a public channel. That's quite common in key generation problems. And we're just saying that covered means that you it looks like nothing is being transmitted over your quantum channel. So say your optical fiber, you don't see that energy was put at the end. So could you, could you motivate it by saying this public channel, many people are using it, so we cannot distinguish who's maybe using... Maybe yeah, exactly. So it's like a regular channel. And what we're saying is we're saying that whatever you see on that public channel has a known distribution, we choose it to be uniform. That's just for uh, simplicity. That's not super fundamental. And we're saying that you cannot correlate that information with what's happening on the quantum channel, all right? So that coveredness constraint says that it seems like the public communication is independent of what you're observing anyway. And what you're observing looks like nothing is being sent through the channel. Okay. 
So I think it's still a meaningful notion of covertness, uh, but of course we're looking at trying to expand that a little bit. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So it is, it's important to, to understand, you know, what are we changing in that model compared to what people have done, right? So again, if you just worry about reliability and secrecy, that's a fairly known problem. I think what's a bit new is us introducing that notion of covertness. And it's important to understand why the two are not equivalent. I mean, none of them imply the other. And the reason is the following. So if you think about secrecy, the secrecy is a constraint on the statistical information content of your signals. So when we're asking that that relative entropy be small, what we're really saying operationally is we're saying that given the eavesdropper's observation, it's best guess about the key that you're gonna generate is actually a completely random guess. The best attack is a guess uniformly at random without looking at the data it observed on the channel of the key bits. And you can imagine the moment you have 100 bits, the probability of guessing the true key is two to the pi two to the minus 100. So effectively, you can do better than that. Now, the covertness constraint is of a very different nature. It's a constraint on the statistical distribution of the signals, not about the information content. And the best way to understand that is in terms of, you know, what is the attacker trying to do? The attacker is trying to detect you, meaning it's building a detector that's trying to decide between two hypotheses. Are you transmitting or are you not transmitting? And we know that every detector is going to be characterized by uh, an ROC curve that is plotting, you know, the probability of detection versus the probability of false alarm, right? So probability of false alarm, I call that alpha. Probability of misdetection, I'm going to call that beta. And you're plotting one minus beta versus alpha. And when we say that the relative entropy between, um, you know, the joint density matrix rho E w and the product rho zero E rho unit w is small, what it really means is I'm saying that the best detector of the adversary in, in terms of its best ROC curve is going to be constrained as a function of mu, so the smaller mu, the, 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 the more stringent the constraint, is going to be constrained to lie on that diagonal, um, you know, one minus beta equal alpha. That's what we're doing operationally. So why does it make sense? Well, we call that covertness because Building a detector whose ROC curve is one minus beta equal alpha is completely trivial. You don't need to look at the data. All you need to do is take a guess and flip a coin. But because it does not depend on the data, it's not a meaningful statistical test. So for instance, if you want to design a detector that operates at alpha equal one and beta equal zero, all you have to do is build a detector that has always false alarms and never miss detection. And, and the way you do that is simply by building a detector that has a deterministic output that always says you're detecting something. So it, it has you know, certain performance, but it's not statistically meaningful. Similarly, if you want to operate at alpha equals zero and beta equal one, you design a detector that never has false alarms and always misses detection. So it's a detector, it's a fire alarm that never rings. All right, so operating on that diagonal is not a statistically meaningful test. And the constraint that we're imposing through that relative entropy is a way of constraining the best detector of the adversary to be no better than a blind guess equivalent to that completely blind detector. So that's the meaning of uh, secrecy and covertness. So covert communication is something that came up fairly recently in information theory. Um, it stemmed out of you know, growing concern for privacy and confidentiality, if I want to be a bit provocative. It partly comes from the fact that Edward Snowden revealed that the NSA doesn't really care about what we transmit, but it cares about who we transmit with. I mean, that was one of the big things we learned. They cared more about metadata than actual information content. And, and people started looking at that from an information theoretic perspective. Uh, I think there is some early work in the early 2000s by Al Hero and uh, Korczyk in Russia. But I think it's really in like, 2012, that Bulat Bash and his collaborator at UMass took a very principled approach to that. And what they showed is what's called now the square root law of covered communication. It's a result that says that if you really want to be undetected, you cannot transmit too much information. And more specifically, you have to operate in a zero rate regime. And that zero rate regime says that out of n channel uses, you can only push square root of n covered bits. Now, the result was not totally uh, complete. 
in the sense that for that to happen, they require a lot of key bits. So in a way, you have to spend a lot of secret bits for that to happen. And that's what we'll revisit today in part. Uh, but this notion of square root law is not unknown. It's something that's known in steganography. People knew in steganography experimentally, not just theoretically, that if you want to distort bits in an image to hide information, you should somehow not distort too many bits. The square root n was showing up quite, uh, quite often. So Mathieu, I have a question. So the, yes, the square root n, is it uh, asymptotics or, or is, uh, is exact? So meaning the constant here is 1? No, so I'll, I'll get to that. So for, for, to talk about the constant, we have to define a notion of covered capacity. Okay. So keep that in the back of your head. I'll have a slide okay. on the notion of covered capacity. Now, what these early results were showing, they were just showing scaling laws. They were okay. not quite okay. identifying the constant, but that's uh, one of the things we learned over the past year. Okay. Um, but yeah, good point. So um, people have extended uh, this notion of covered communication in several ex uh, directions. The one most relevant to today's talk are extensions to the quantum setting. Um, there's a very nice paper by Bulat Bash um, and his collaborators, again, uh, that was published in Nature Communications. It's always nice to see some information theory work in nature papers. Uh, for some reason, you have to make it quantum to make it publishable in nature. But uh, I think that's a really nice paper that has both an, uh, theoretical and experimental component. Um, and also the idea that people realized uh, not too long after that you don't necessarily need a key for covered communication to happen. And people also realized how to construct codes for covered communication. And that's what really fueled our interest in making quantum key distribution covered. You know, without these early works, even asking the question didn't quite make sense. So I'll kind of convince you that indeed that's possible. There are tons of other intriguing results in that space if you're interested. Um, you know, we've looked at first and second order asymptotics, effect of noise, uh, multi-user channels, but that's less relevant for today's talk. So in one slide, I'm going to spoil everything. I'm going to tell you where that square root law is coming from. And so it's going to be either a big haha moment or a big disappointment. Um, but I think that diagram was will explain everything. So let's simplify the problem to the extreme. And let's imagine that we can transmit two symbols, x0 and x1. And x0 is a symbol that says you're not doing anything. So it's like 0 on a Gaussian channel. And x1 is 1. You transmit energy or you don't. That's what we're capturing here. So the upper diagram is going to represent the time domain signals. And the lower one is going to represent the distribution observed by your adversary at the output of the channel. So if you don't transmit anything, if there is noise on the channel, you will observe a bell curve, right? So it's like Gaussian thermal noise. Hey, Anand, you're late. You know, hey, I have an exam. <laughs> I'm not sure you will pass this class. You know? It's pass fail. Great to see you. Uh, so, um, you know, if, if you don't transmit anything, you might still observe that bell curve because there's thermal noise in your detection or if there's interference in the channel. If you transmit a one, uh, you can imagine you're putting energy into your system, so you're going to shift that bell curve. Now, from the perspective of the adversary, I think it's not too hard to convince yourself that if you observe enough samples, you're going to very, going to very quickly realize that the mean of your observation is going to be way beyond zero, and therefore you can assume fairly effectively that somebody is communicating. Uh, now, in practice, when people communicate, they alternate between 0 and 1. So what you really get to observe, so in the time domain, is that uh, rectangle-like signals, you oscillate between 0 and 1. In terms of distribution, you have this mixture. It's not just one mode. You have two modes, for instance. And your goal is to make sure that you, know, you cannot distinguish the mixture from the yellow curve, which is what you expect when you don't do anything. Now, again, when you look at the picture I have here, where you have roughly 50% ones, 50% zeros, the two modes have about the same strength. And therefore, it's not too hard to convince yourself that, again, an attacker gathering enough samples will realize you're doing something to the channel. Now, the only way you can prevent that from happening is if your mixture has so few ones that the two modes are essentially indistinguishable from the single mode that you expected initially. Now, when does that happen? Well, that might happen if you can guarantee that the fraction of ones that you introduce in your stream is indistinguishable from the noise that is always present in your statistics. 
And what you know from the CLT is that it will be you know, in square root of n. So that's where that square root n law comes from. It says if you have n samples, if you distort more than square root of n of them, you will be detectable. So you're limited by that. And that's really what the square root n law comes from. It's the idea that the only way you can be undetectable is if you stay, if the distortion that you introduce stays below the statistical noise um, that you, you expect to observe. Sounds good? All right, so what does that mean in the context of covert and secret key expansion, which is what we did. And uh, we published a paper with Merdad in Physical Review A earlier this year that describes all that. So to, to really answer that question, you know, how do you do covert and secret key generation? It's good to look at what people had thought about before we came in. And there's a really cool paper by uh, Juan Miguel Arazzola and Valerio Scarani that was a bit a few years before, in which they had a very pessimistic view on this, in which they said, well, that's never going to work. And the reason is the following. So if you want to be covered, I think I know I conveyed that intuition that you somehow need to make sure that you don't transmit in too many ones. OK, so said differently, you want to guarantee that if you give me, uh, and I'm going to change notation a little bit, if you give me capital T possible slots in which to communicate, the number of slots in which I effectively communicate has to be very small, square root of t. That's what the square root law is for covered communication. And then the key question is, how do you make sure Alice and Bob agree on what the square root of t effective communication slots are? Where are they in the big stream? And so a very natural thing to do is to say, well, let's have Alice and Bob use a secret key to select what I call small l here on the order of square root of t locations in which you can transmit a state that will effectively encode information. And in all the other slots, you're not doing anything. So that's what I'm representing pictorially here in this diagram. In gray, I'm transmitting 0. So I'm not detectable, because that's what uh, it means not to communicate. But in some slots, I can actually I have the option of transmitting a 1. And so I can actually convey information in these slots. And Alice and Bob have agreed, using a secret key, to use L of these slots. OK. Now, uh, what you can show is that if indeed L is scaling like square root of t, you can control that relative entropy and guarantee that you're undetectable. All right, so I'm still hiding the constant setting, but you can actually identify that constant. Now, what it does, and that's why that protocol was uh, very natural and easy to implement, is that given that Alice and Bob know where there is information, they can ignore all the other locations. And so effectively, what's happening is that their effective block length is reduced from t to square root of t, because they know in that in the locations not indexed by the key, there's no information. So all the information processing is done on that effective block length of square root of t. And all they have to do is run a quantum key distribution protocol on these square root of t locations. And everything will work fine. So OK. So far, so good. What's the issue? I have a question, Matthew. Yes, so sir. I may have missed the setting here or the problem. So, if they have, if they already have a shared key, so why they don't they want to generate the key? Did I miss something? Yeah, exactly. That's the problem. Okay, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, okay. so keep in mind the problem here is to so generate so you're allowed to start with hundred bits of secret key, say. Yeah. But if out of hundred bits of secret key, you generate hundred and one. Okay. Then you gain something, right? Okay. Right. So that's what we're getting at. You know, as is that you know, people call that secret key expansion. You know, <laughs> you're allowed to start from a secret key as long as you generate more than what you receive. So my other question is, uh, could you, um, if it's covered, then could you not use the covered communication to generate the key by the location when you talk, where you talk, the position? Um, that's an interesting point. The answer is no. Um, and so I'm going to try to answer that. So hold okay. on to that thought. We can go back to it in a few slides if you don't okay. mind. But yeah, so th there's something fishy with what I'm describing here. And I think that's what's perturbing you, but that's on purpose. Okay. Right? Okay. There's something that seems weird, right? So I I'm using a key to index the location. My block length is square root of t. What's going to happen? Okay. Well, what's going to happen is what they said very honestly in that paper. They say it doesn't work. Because quantum key distribution, if you want to make it covered, will consume more secret key bits than it can generate. And mathematically, the reason is the following. 
because you're coordinating by deciding ahead of time what are the locations in which you're going to transmit and you choose this number of locations to scale like square root of t if you look at the entropy of a binary random variable with a probability of being equal to one p scaling like one over square root of t which is what you need to get square root of t locations if you wish it will scale like square root t log t that's a number of key bits that you need to index square root of t bits and that's because you know your entropy function is not at all linear i mean you know if you plot the binary entropy function uh, you know, where P is very small, it's very steep, right? So this is telling you that the amount of key that you need to make your protocol work and index the location scales like square root of T log T. Now, the number of key bits that you can effectively generate, it cannot exceed a constant times the effective block length, which is square root of T. And so you end up in a situation where to get square root of T bits, you need to spend square root of T log T. So as T gets large, it will never work. So I think Salim, you were asking, you know, can you get secrecy from the locations? This is not what that protocol does, okay? That protocol agrees on the locations and then it tries to get keys. And this is just arguing that that will never work. Okay. Because you need more T, but you were ahead of me already. You know, if you're an information theorist, you're like, why do we need to do that? I mean, maybe there's a way to actually not specifically indicate the locations and then maybe we can extract information. And that's exactly what we tried to do. So what we can change is we can change how we try to process information. What's tricky here is because you operate in that zero rate regime, the information content that you're trying to process is very diffuse. So it's very hard to process the data because the useful information is scaling like square root of t. So it goes to zero really fast. It's not easy to design good codes for that regime, by the way, right? So we like to think that we can design codes for any rate, but the reality, if we're honest, and I hope there are not too many coding theorists listening to me right now, the only good codes we know are of rate one half, okay? For symmetric channels, okay? You can push it a little bit, but there is no way you can design a very good code operating close to the channel limits, unless you do tricks, that will operate at a rate of 0 0.00001. We don't really know how to do that. And that's kind of the challenge here. We have to process very diffuse information. And so the coordination trick that people use when they indicate the location of the positions where they have information is a trick to concentrate that diffuse information. If we know where the information is, the block length is you know, square root of t. We've concentrated everything. And in the square root of t positions, you can use your regular processing tricks because then the information is concentrated. And, and so what we're going to try to do and what we showed is possible is actually we don't need this. It's actually possible to concentrate the information only through processing without coordinating a priori. So we try to remove that coordination, if you wish. So um, the idea of our protocol is the following. Instead of agreeing on where the information is, all we're going to say is that Alice is going to generate sparse signals where she sends a one by flipping a coin with probability uh, one over square root of t, she sends a one, otherwise she sends a zero. So on average, you do expect to get square root of t ones. Uh, what you get at the output is you get uh, you know, a product density matrix that corresponds to these random choices of 0, 1. You can show that the transmission will, will remain covered uh, under my assumption just because you have a small fraction of ones. And Bob is going to measure, um, you know, it's going to make a quantum measurement, but it's going to get a series of classical uh, numbers that he's going to use to figure out what's going on. And then you can say, okay, let's try to use that. Let's use reconciliation and privacy amplification like in any good uh, quantum key distribution protocol. And then you have a problem. Why? Because the known techniques don't directly work. Because if you remember my early slides on source coding with side information and privacy amplification, all the results have to do with entropies. So if you compute the uncertainty of y given x, this is big O of t. But the actual information content, i of x, y, the scaling of the mutual information between x and y, it scales like square root of t. So again, you would be in a situation where you need to, to transmit way too many bits to actually hope to extract that square root of t. So for those of you who, who um, are a bit more aware of the subtleties involved in random coding arguments, for instance, you know that there are epsilon and deltas that are hidden behind these quantities. And uh, even if you have a, 
you know, when I say h of y given x is the limit of source coding with side information, there is a term that scales like square root of t. And that term is a penalty that's not uh, avoidable. And that's going to dominate the actual term that you care about, which is in square root of t. So it's, it's really telling you, again, this doesn't work. And our main contribution in that paper was to actually show that it's possible to circumvent that. And, and what we had to do to prove that you know, we can still make uh, the system work is to forgive the use of these traditional you know, syndrome coding techniques, if you wish, and privacy amplification and use tools that never talk about entropy. We can prove everything always only talking about mutual information and um, we can circumvent that very fine technical difficulty. So um, um, what I have, what, five, 10 minutes left? So I'm not going to go really into any detail as to how we prove that. Um, I encourage you to look at our paper if you're interested. Ten more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll show you just the flavor of what we proved. And, and one thing we proved is we proved uh, bounds on what we call the covered capacity. And going back to one of Salim's earlier question, the covered capacity is essentially the constant that's hidden in front of the square root of t. And that, that forces you to rethink a little bit how you define capacity, all right? So the way we're going to define it is as follows. We're going to say that the throughput is achievable if you can find a sequence of protocols that operate over uh, t stages, so that's your block lines, effectively, and generates LT bits while consuming potentially RT bits of pre-shared secret key in such a way that as t gets large, you know, your epsilon, which is a reliability parameter, goes to 0. Delta goes to 0. That's your secrecy parameter. Mu t goes to 0. That's your covertness parameter. Lt grows, meaning you are generating something. And then you're guaranteeing that Lt, the number of key bits you get, minus Rt, the number of key bits you started from. Okay, So Salim, that's where uh, the need for generating more key than you've used is important. Uh, so that has to be positive. And we're normalizing by square root of t times mu t. Okay, And we're asking that to be a constant. So that should be a bit weird. Okay, So if you look at that, you look like, I mean, that's definitely not how we talk about capacity usually, and indeed. So behind that definition, I'm hiding a lot of things. I'm hiding the fact that I think that the optimal scaling that I get is square root of t. Um, so this is only proved with hindsight, by the way. but um, I'm putting it here in, as part of my definition. And second, I'm normalizing by the constant that determines the coveredness. And this is the expression of something a bit funny, which is that in the context of covered communication, there is no strong converse result. Meaning that if your parameter mu t scales differently, you can change the number of secret key bits that you can communicate. And intuitively, the reason is the following. Remember, coveredness is all about making a statement about your detect the detection ability of the adversary. And the, the kind of test is running. If mu t goes to 0 really, really fast, you're saying that the test the adversary is running should really be extremely close to a blind test. But if mu t scales slower, it means you're allowing some slack. And that slack allows you to push more or less bits. So that's a little funny, but that's required. Again, that you can only prove that with hindsight. When the covered capacity, assuming that you agree with that weird definition, is defined as the supremum of the constant theta. Now, if you disagree with that definition, uh, I can give you uh, some rational for why my results will be OK. Number one, if I'm making a mistake, my results will be trivial. If I'm overestimating my throughput, meaning my scaling by square root of t is uh, overly optimistic, then whatever theta I find has to be 0. On the other hand, if I'm too pessimistic and actually can get a better scaling, it means I should be able to find a protocol for which that theta is infinite. So the fact that I will eventually bound theta with a constant kind of says that this is the right scale. And what we showed uh, with Merdad, and I'm only showing it here, uh, some lower bound is that you can actually get interesting bounds on that uh, covered key capacity. Um, I'm just going to talk about the first one here for simplicity, just to show you that it captures the important characteristics of the channel. It's telling you that there exists a protocol that will generate keys at throughputs given by the right-hand side of that first uh, expression. So 
The first term is a square root of two divided by a chi-square distance between the density matrices corresponding to the eavesdropper observing the output of the channel when you send a one and the same output when you send a zero. So the fact that it's at the denominator is very pleasing because if the two channels here are very hard to distinguish by default, the channel is so noisy that it's hard to distinguish in a zero and a one, that quantity is small and you get a huge boost in covered capacity, meaning it's easier to hide in a channel that's already very noisy. Um, and the second term is a difference between relative entropies, which is not um, you know, too different from what you would expect in a key generation problem where you expect a difference between mutual informations. Here is a difference between relative entropies, but the first relative entropy captures how well your legitimate receiver is able to distinguish one as zero, whereas the second relative entropy, which comes in as a penalty, captures how hard it is for the attacker to distinguish a one and a zero. So overall, despite you know, the arguably fairly intricate expression here, uh, it captures all the intuition that you might have about the problem. Um, and to conclude, I mean, you know, these things are all nice, but if you talk to physicists, they don't really care about this until you tell them what it means in terms of an experiment. So we didn't do any experiment yet. Uh, we're working on one uh, with some colleagues, but at least on paper, if you specialize a little bit your channel and you imagine that your channel is an optical fiber, and you imagine the following setup. So you can encode information, your bits, onto optical uh, coherent states, which are essentially pulses of light heavily attenuated. So a zero is mapped to you doing nothing. And a one is you mapping to a coherent state I call alpha here, which is a laser pulse heavily attenuated. You send that through a channel. Your channel has a beam splitter. One output goes to Bob. The other output goes to Alice. And uh, they're trying to detect what's going on. And so you can then compute exactly what are the rates that we were observing. Uh, we made some assumptions about the efficiency of the photon counters for detection, the average photon number that we're transmitting, the loss of the fiber. And uh, we're assuming here that we have a, a distance between uh, Alice and the eavesdropper, which is three kilometers of fiber. And what we're plotting here is the covert and secret key throughput. So it's in nats per square root of channel use. Okay, so again, the reason it has that weird units is because we're normalizing by the square root of the block length, not the block length. And we're plotting that as a function of distance between Alice and Bob. And as you can imagine, as the distance between Alice and Bob grows, it becomes harder and harder for them to generate anything. But we have two protocols that we studied and we can show that, you know, still in some cases, you can generate covered and secret key bits with a non-zero throughput. The one thing I want to draw your attention on is the fact that the number of bits that we can generate is ridiculously low. And so that's unfortunately inherent to the problem because we have that square root, square root law that limits what we can do. There's no way we can hope to get high throughput. And so inherently covert and secret communication is possible. I think that was one of the main uh, things that we proved but the rates that you should expect are you know, zero, essentially. You can get a few bits through, but not much. So definitely the applications for that are limited to very niche situations where you would care about you know, security so much that you're willing to forgive uh, throughput. So we can hide you know, 100 bits, but we won't be able to hide your Netflix movie. So I'm running out of time. So I will completely skip a section I had on coding. Uh, the main takeaway there is actually we've made a lot of progress to actually show how we can do that processing that I discussed uh, before, and that's hidden behind the theorems. We know how to do that with actual codes. That's the work of Ishak, um, and I have the references here if you're interested. So I'll go to the conclusion a bit quickly. So the main takeaway from our work is that it's possible to do not only secret key expansion over quantum channels, it's also possible to be undetectable. Uh, we established preliminary results. It's not you know, against the most general kind of attacks. We're not quite close to the model that people in QKD, quantum key distribution, really care about, which is making almost no assumption on the adversary. But we've really made progress towards that recently. And the, the, the one really cool thing that drove me to that problem is that you have to process this very weird signal that have a very diffuse information content. 
So it makes a lot of the coding and information theory, information theory problem slightly different from what we're used to doing. You have to develop means to concentrate either through pre-coding or post-processing that very diffuse information content to then be able to reuse your uh, favorite tools. So I think I'll stop here. There are many more lingering questions behind that topic that we're actively exploring. Thanks again for listening. And I think maybe I can take one question or two questions. Sally yeah. for the master here. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. So I think I have a question, so maybe a very high level. So have uh, people thought of applying this kind of covered problem, asking question on a higher level than physical layer? I mean, so in, in the context, say, let's say at the network layer, yeah, network layer with many users. So I mean, I haven't thought about, but I mean, if it's also there, it could be also. A yeah, absolutely. So um, it's possible to apply that here. Um, the the big challenge, though, is that like any problem in physical layer security, you can only be covered if there is some noise, right? So if you're giving me a, a setup where there's a channel with some noise, uh, things will work. It will not work, for instance, if your channel is just an erasure channel. If all you're doing is dropping packets, that's not enough for me to be undetectable because the fact that you can get the packet without noise every once in a while is going to kill me. So for so me, other, the noise on, a, on the higher level would be other users talking. Oh, so yeah, yeah, exactly. So absolutely. So it's possible to actually define covertness with a different baseline. So here, what I'm describing is a very extreme baseline where I'm trying to make my behavior undistinguishable from no one doing anything on the channel. And that's where the square root law comes from. That's a very pessimistic model in a way. If your baseline is a bit different, it's you want to hide in the crowd, right? So there's a you know, background noise, then actually results are much more optimistic. And you can sometimes recover, you know, positive rates of communication. There is no square root law. And to be honest, I think experimentally, that's where things are much more promising. Okay. Yes, absolutely. That, that that would work too. That would fall into that general framework too. Okay, good. So I don't know if there is more questions. So thanks again, Mathieu. And uh, the talk will be posted on YouTube so people can comment or ask questions or email you. Or troll me. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again, Salim. That, that was thanks. awesome. Thanks again for organizing that. Um, yeah. And see you soon.